from CSR NEST Zorhat, Assam, India. On behalf of the organizing committee of IBWCST 2022, I welcome you all to the second lecture of today's session. As this workshop is progressing, it is getting more and more interesting with many renowned speakers across the globe. During morning session, we have witnessed a very enlightening lecture delivered by Honorable Director of Institute of Seismological Research, Gujarat, Dr. Sumer Soprasar, on seismicity in interpolate Gujarat region. And for this afternoon session, we have with us Honorable Head of CSIR Fort Paradigm Institute, Bangalore, Dr. C. Debbie Z. Madam as a keynote speaker, and she will be delivering a talk on the topic GNSS Best Geoscience Research in Indian Subcontinent. We wholeheartedly welcome you to our session, ma'am. Once again, we thank everyone for joining us today and for showing your continued support and overwhelming response throughout this event. We look forward to your interactive participation at the end of the session also. Today, we are privileged to have with us Professor Zair Kyle, ex Deputy Director General of Geological Survey of India, as the session chairperson. We are also glad to have Dr. Sumer Sopra, Honorable Director of Institute of Seismological Research, Gujarat, as guest in our today's session. Now, May I request Honorable Session Chairperson Professor Kyle Sir to provide his initial remark. Over to Professor Kyle Sir. Yes, good afternoon, Professor Jade. So nice to see you <laughs> after a long time on online, of course. Yes, uh, we know each other for maybe for the last two decades or three decades. We have met in different uh, forum, different uh, workshop, meeting and interview board and all that and sort of many occasions. So I, I know uh, Prof. Sridevit Jade, Prof. Sridevit Jade is one of the authorities in GPS studies in the country. And I uh, always enjoy reading her publications. And it's amazing that, you know, uh, maybe many of you know or may not know uh, she is from engineering background, but the way the way she interprets things, data in terms of geology and geophysics, that is amazing. So we always enjoy your uh, publications, reading your publications. Now today we want to listen. I think after a long time I'm listening to you. So we all look forward to listening to you, and thank you so much to be with us in this afternoon. So over to. Anka, please go ahead with the program. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I would like to request Honorable Director of Institute of Seismological Research, Dr. Sumer Soprasar, to say a few words. Over to Dr. Soprasar. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. So I am seeing Madam after maybe after more than 10 years. Actually, we met when I was in ministry last time. I think we met in 2012 or 2013. It's really a pleasure to madam, see you after such a long time. Actually, we were in ISR, we, were, uh, we have an association with the madam since um, for many, I think, two, three uh, research problems. And two of our scientists, uh, uh, Dr. Pallavi Chaudhary and Dr. Rakesh Dumka, has already done some work with madam. And uh, they have already learned a lot and some background information also they got from madam and how to uh, process the GPS data and then how to get information out of that about this tectonic deformation. So with, with, with her guidance, they are now doing a good work and they have already published a lot of papers uh, regarding this uh, crystal deformation studies in different part of uh, Gujarat, like in Narbada also and, and, and Kutch also. So it's, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, Madam's talk because every time we we'll, we learned a lot from her talk, so I'm happy to uh, see Madam after such a long time and privileged that uh, I have to uh, see her presentation after a long time. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much, sir. Before moving ahead, may I request Dr. Sinmar Raskur, who is a scientist at Geoscience and Technology Division, CSR NEST, to read out an illuminating biodata of Dr. C. Debbie Z. Madam. Over to Dr. Yaskor. Thank you, Mr. Navajati. A very good morning from India to one and all present here today. It's an honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for this session, Dr. Sri Devi Jare from CSIR 4 PI Institute in Bangalore, India. 
Now I'm going to read out a concise biodata of Madam to our participants. Dr. Srijabi Zare is an outstanding scientist and head of the CSI Food Paradigm Institute, Bangalore, India. She has completed her master's and PhD degree in engineering from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Dr. Zare started her career as a scientist in CSIR Central Building Research Institute, Roorkee. In 1993, she has joined the Center for Mathematical Modeling and Computer Simulation, Bangalore, which is currently known as CSI 4PI or Fourth Paradigm Institute. Her research interest includes global positioning system studies in Indian subcontinent, crustal deformation studies using GPS measurements, numerical modeling in the area of rock me mechanics, modeling of highly discontinuous media in art crust, etc. She has authored more than 70 high quality research articles, book chapters and conference papers published in journals of national and international repute. Dr. Zare was conferred with Sir C. V. Raman Young Scientist State Award in the year 2002 and National Mineral Award in 2008 by Ministry of Mines, Government of India. With this brief introduction, now may I request Madam to take over the digital forum and enlighten us with her lecture. Over to Madam. Hello, good, after good afternoon for all the Indian participants and good day for all the rest of the participants. I'm really honored uh, that uh, Professor Kayal spoke so high of me because I remember when I first wrote a paper on Northeast when I was clueless. <laughs> so, he actually, you know, gave his comments and then he told me how to do it and all. See, I, like he said, I am from engineering background. So, you know, the way I look at things is completely different from the people who are trained in the earth sciences background. So, maybe that also, I mean, it's an advantage and disadvantage. So, but I managed now, like it's all past history. I'm so happy to see Professor Kaya. And Sumer, I know for very long, so <laughs> it's like we have known each other for years now. When we were, when he was very young, I know him. So from then I have been seeing. Actually, I know who, most of the people who work in the GPS field in the country because somewhere or other, most of them uh, were trained at our institute. So most of them, so I think almost all of them, <laughs> starting from... Uh, Parmesh Benerji to CD Reddy to the youngsters, Dumka, everyone, other than the new people who are now working. So it's an honor uh, to be here and able to see my long uh, associates and my introduction. For thank you for my introduction. Thank God you made it short. People go on and on and on. So I really appreciate You could have made it a little more short also. <laughs> okay. So with this, I'll share my. Slide. I actually, you know, I was when they asked me, like, I thought I will pick up a general topic. So it basically covers my years of research. Uh, but it also give, gives a glimpse of how we can use GPS for so many applications, geoscience applications. So uh, that is what I chose. Instead of narrowing it down to one uh, single publication or one single thing which I'm working on, because I thought this is a forum where you know you can give a broad perspective so with that i had chosen this now i will share my uh, screen and then start my presentation i have about an hour my time yes ma'am you have one hour Could can you see that? No, no one. We just not tried it now. We are here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let me again. We I just left it like that. I think it's not opening my window. Okay, I'll open it again okay. once again. 
Yeah. You can see it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. I'll start. So this is my first slide. So basically, I'm going to talk about uh, how we use GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite System, that is the GPS, Global Positioning System, for doing geoscience research. This is all specific to Indian subcontinent. So as you can see on the um, uh, left side, this is the IGS station, which it is actually, you know, this talk is basically my uh, two to three decades of research. So this actually, the station on the left, this is the first uh, uh, global station, international GPS station, which we set up. And then this on the right, this is the station, our highest altitude station at Hanle in Ladakh where they have a telescope now. This is at 4,000 pounds. The rest are all our campaign stations. So I'll give you a glimpse of how we use GPS for research, geoscience research. So before that, I just put one slide because I'm from a fourth paradigm institute. So since most of the people ask, I put a slide on paradigms of science. What do we mean? So basically, fourth paradigm of science means nothing but big data analytics. That is big data science which we talk because your first paradigm is experimental way you do experiments. And the second paradigm is when you write equations to solve those experimental data. These are all analytical solutions. So second paradigm has uh, not like last few hundred years where we, don't, we have not used computers to solve equations. And the third paradigm is where our computational, um, we use computers to solve the equations, so numerical methods and all that. So that's the third paradigm. Fourth paradigm is you have huge amounts of data. So what does the data tell you? Sometimes, you know, you may be thinking for some kind of, uh, uh, kind of the trend in a data or some kind of, uh, you know, it gives you some kind of uh, statistical uh, inputs to the when it's statistical inputs to the data and all that. But sometimes, you know, it just throws out some discovery which you wouldn't have even expected. So uh, that is how now this day big data analytics is coming to fore. And, you know, we are also using this for the geoscience research right now in our lab. We started using this basic mainly for the broadband seismic data. The only the word of caution of using uh, big data science is uh, one should be, you should focus more on the science part of it than data mining. You should have the domain knowledge of science. Otherwise, we come out with um, results which are not actually correct. So with this, we'll go back. So this is the crux of my talk, basically. So uh, we have... Uh, a near real-time GNSS network, which actually I should not say we have. We started it in uh, in the country in 1994. That time DST funded it. Then uh, we had the collaborations with 20-25 people and we set up stations across the country, continuous stations, which were 24 bar 7. And then we did some campaign measurements also. Most of the continuous stations right now we don't have. We handed over to the host institutes. We do not have. Right now we only have a IGS station in Bangalore and uh, Kashmir network is our active network right now. So how, what do we do? We take the data from GPS. So the GPS data basically gives you the surface deformation. Like how much is the surface deformation crustal velocity? Then you use that uh, input and then you come out with, I will show you how we define the reference frame, how you come out with uh, research related to seismic hazard. On the flip side of it, GPS also gives you, because the signal that comes from satellite to uh, Earth, basically, that also gives you 
troposphere and ionosphere because it passes through troposphere and ionosphere the signal and then there will be some kind of signal delay or signal advancement which you can isolate and use it to derive water vapor and in the atmosphere and total electron content in ionosphere which can be used this total electron content can be used for as a precursor study for earthquakes and also for ionosphere variability studies whereas water vapor can be used for weather forecasting extreme rainfall cloud burst etc then if you have like right now our network has co-located broadband seismic instruments so if you have that then you can also add this uh, the results from this uh, uh, broadband seismic into your uh, earthquake hazard study so we have recently integrated both gps and broadband seismic data in the real sense uh, to estimate uh, seismic hazard in kashmir so that also is one of the things and i, I have used in collaboration with our uh, sister lab center building research institute real time monitoring of landslide using gps so that is one of the applications glacial and volcano applications uh, we haven't done but it can be used for we tried doing in andamans for volcano but glacial i think um, uh, gb pant institute is doing it Uh, so and volcano as of now in the in our country i don't think anyone is doing we tried but then you know in andaman the two volcanoes we tried but then our instrument got stolen and we could not do it so i'll just cover a, a bit of all this so before going to the research i just thought i'll give some four five slides on the how we do it so that you know the problem what happens is when people start working you know they forget the basics the concepts so i thought i'll cover five slides on the concepts and then i'll go to the results so basically is as simple as this uh, gps basically these are the gps satellites they give you the position on the surface of the earth 24 by 7 and the time precise time so you have four and un four unknowns x y z and the time so you need approximately four simultaneous equations to solve it so the the signal when it travels from satellite to the receiver it gives you the time so time uh, taken for it to travel and once you have the time taken then you know this distance because it is seeing to speed of the signal into time so you have from four satellite four distances you draw an arc where it meets is the position this is the simplest Uh, this thing of how position is determined in gps conceptually but then when we actually do it's much more complicated i just thought i'll simple concept i'll cover so when we talk about what is the difference between gps and gnss see gnss is a new term global navigation satellite system when we started in 1994 it was gps only gps is nothing but the satellite systems that is operated by us so that was the terminology for gps but now later on we have and earlier also we had glonass but this was not available for civilian use and because of the disintegration of soviet union and all that it took some time to get back to uh, its original this thing so glonass so basically when we say global navigation satellite systems you have global positioning systems satellite systems of us which are called gps russia which is glonass then european union have galileo and china has bdo china's bdo is very active and very aggressively they are doing research in this area and the amount of papers they publish is mind boggling like we can't even read them you know this so much of all applications of gps using their uh, be, they use their own uh, satellite system their own software for analysis then we have regional navigation satellite system one is the japanese one basically these satellite systems improve the accuracy on a specific region so japan has qzss and we have our irnss and navic india then uh, gnss terminology also uh, basically covers all the, uh, uh, the 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 whole system like satellite Uh, when the space segment the control segment the user segment everything also is is 
GNSS terminology covers that. And then you also have something called, um, like in India, we have Gagan, then was these are argumentation systems. I'll tell you what they do. They basically improve on the fly accuracy. So these are the what the terminology GNSS means. So I just put a slide. What are the differences between different satellite? See, three or four of them are global. That is, they cover the Earth globally. GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, BDO, and these are regional. So this slide I kept it. People who want can look at it. What are the differences? What are the similarities between these different navigation systems? So this is what I am talking about. Space argumentation system. This is like on the fly. You have a like you have an aeroplane, you want to know the path of the aeroplane on the fly very accurately. So basically what you have uh, reference stations which look at the satellites, get the data, give on the fly position which is uploaded to an uplink station and then to a geostationary satellite. The geostationary satellite is at a distant height of 36,000 whereas your GPS satellites are at a height of 19 to 23,000. So on the fly, it will give the precise position for aircraft navigation. So this is used like European Union has, I think the American one is uh, called Wide Area Argumentation uh, Network and ours is called Gagan. And then one is European and this, I don't remember, it is one of the countries. So this is what, when they say space-based documentation systems, these are the space-based documentation systems. So these are the different kinds of orbits. So you have GPS satellites, whether it is Galileo, GLONASS, anything in these orbits, ranging from 19,000 to 23,000. Then uh, what actually, you know, when BDO satellite system, China has both satellites in geostationary, geosynchronous, and then GPS satellites here. Right now, this is the best uh, satellite uh, navigation system and it has a very wide variety of applications the China one. So the problem is when you uh, clutter or uh, when you storm the space with so many satellites when I started it was only GPS satellites there are around 24 of them covering earth at equal inclination at, uh, and you know and they were equally covering all areas of the earth correctly so that much simpler life it is now we have crowded the space with so many gps satellites i'm only talking about gps if you talk of space crowding then there's too many things but this gps satellite so now the problem which we face is if we want to use those for our research geoscience research because our research basically needs precisions of millimeters and all then the problem is the interoperability and compatibility between different systems. Like I showed you in earlier slides, slide which shows what is the subtle differences between the global navigation. Like, for example, I want to use GPS and GLONASS together. Then, you know, I, I'm not sure whether those signals, because they have a different reference frames, they have a, a different signals and their um, timing standards. So when you use so much of data, see earlier like I'm using some, after 24 sat GPS satellites, I would use some uh, at a time eight to nine satellites that are tracked to get my position. So you just imagine the first slide, that equation we write with so many satellites. Now you add GLONASS to it. And then the reference frames are different. So how do you compare it? Com combine them? See, you should combine them at a the conceptual level. The max and physics, it's not like, you know, GLONASS gives you one position, GPS gives you one, you average it out. That is not the combination. The combination is at the conceptual level. So then it becomes very complicated. Right now, uh, currently, um, I mean, scientists are combining GPS and GLONASS. But, you know, how advanced, I mean, how it is benefits us depends on the application like you know for our application what i noticed was because we did for indian subcontinent and we published also that it does not add anything extra to us only thing is the noise levels are high see when you are talking about millimeter accuracy and if the noise levels are also in millimeters it does not make any sense so for indian subcontinent right now it does not benefit us for geoscience research but it will definitely benefit us the, the, the thing is we are not dependent on a single 
satellite system. Like tomorrow, if Russia switches off, we can use um, uh, American one or America switches off, we have uh, Russian one like that. So at least to that extent, we are not dependent on one. So, but otherwise, right now for Indian subcontinent, it doesn't benefit this many satellite systems. So this is one issue which I wanted to tell. Then we come to uh, this thing, like our first slide where I said, you know, this is the distance and then you do it. So when the signal passes from satellite to the receiver, this is where the complexity comes. Is that you start off with error in the, see the satellite orbits are also determined using the ground stations. So using uh, a set of equations. So they also come with, everything has some error in it inherently. So the orbit has an error, the satellite orbit. Then the satellite clock has an error. And then when the signal passes through uh, the, our Earth from satellite to receiver, when it enters the Earth's atmosphere, you have ionospheric refraction, then you have tropospheric refraction. Multipath is nothing but when there is something obstructs the signal. It reflects from there and comes instead of coming straight. And then you have the receiver noise. Now this receiver noise, when you have a receiver which can track all Galileo, GLONASS, BDO, GPS, the noise levels are higher compared to earlier just the GPS signal. So that is also an issue. So we need to, so we have kind of softwares which which we, when the public domain ones, which one can use to remove all these errors and get a position. But then there is always a, see these softwares are not like graphic user interface or, uh, you know, not easy to use. And if you try to use it as a black box, then we end up making a lot of mistakes. So we should be, very, see, that is what I'm saying. Whether you do anything you do, you need to get your concepts right. Then do it, then your results would be correct. So uh, the, with this, I will, uh, so this is, uh, so to do this, we need basically, this is the control segment. That is where we have global, global GPS stations. Now they are all global GNSS stations. Most of the stations have GNSS receivers now. They track all the global satellite system. So in India, we have one in Bangalore, which we set up in 1995, then Hyderabad later on. Then there is uh, one in Sri Lanka, one in Port Blair, and one in Lucknow. I think there are two in Lucknow next to each other. I think the Survey of India and Geological Survey, both are one one IGS station. So these are, so these IGS station data basically is used to refine your orbits of the satellites also. So it is advantageous if you have more IGS stations here because, you know, the satellite orbits will be that much precise over Indian space. And also when we solve the more stations we have, our resolution of our position is high. So the, it adds to us, but right now we have around four to five stations. So that is also kind of disadvantage for us. So we use this and then we solve for the position. So like... This is the network, which uh, the results which I got from this network is what I'm going to show now. So we started it in 1995, like I've said, under the ages of DST, then it went to MOES. So we have data of almost like two to three decades. Different, like in Northeast, we started in 2001, I guess. So we have around two decades of data from Northeast. But these stations are now handed over to host institutions. So we request and they give us. It is like that because we had set up it's just on goodwill. So as you can see, all these yellow triangles are continuous stations. And this uh, campaign, campaign means you ep episodic measurements. Like you measure uh, this year three days or four days. And again, you measure next year three to four days. Continuous are which run continuously 24 bar 7. So nowadays you have both, earlier the interval was we used to use 30 second interval for tracking the receivers, but now we use both one second and 30 second. So one second data, actually, if you plot, it looks like broad, broadband seismograph. So right now our active network is in this region, Kashmir, which is running, other than a few permanent stations, which are spread across the country. So this map also shows the seismicity of Indian subcontinent, all the blue 
this thing has smaller um, earthquakes and these are the earthquakes with focal mechanism solutions. Once we solve, like I have showed, for every day you get a position. You solve 30 second data. So for one day, you get, if you get the average position using 30 second data, because every time the signal, every 30 seconds we track, one second, this is the 30 second data one. Then you get a position and this is the error bar. So similarly, for each day you get a position error bar. This is for Sikkim station basically in Himalaya, the one you are seeing. And if you make campaign measurements, like from this was uh, measured from 1996, I think, to 2008. So you have, so this bunch is nothing but this one measurement of this. So like that you plot, then the slope gives you the velocity. So this is a velocity is north direction. This is a velocity in east and this is the up velocity. So in uh, GPS, your up component resolution is not that because, you know, the up component motion is actually much lesser than the error usually because, you know, we don't have much motion in the vertical direction. So but you can use this up component when there is an earthquake because that, that time the, the movement is high, so your error bars are less, so you can use it. So this is how it is when you have a campaign data. So when you plot a permanent data, permanent station continuous data, this is. So each one of them, if you can see, this is for almost like uh, from 2000, I think, 4 to 2012. So each, each actually, this each one is one uh, position with error bar, if you... Enlarge it, you can see like I showed in the earlier, this is our IGS station IASC and this is our high altitude station at Hanley. So this is how you get and from here you get the position of the station and how it is varying over a period of time. So you get uh, velocity like uh, for IASC 34 millimeters plus or minus point. Even if you take your WRMS, weighted RMS also, it is plus or minus 1.4 millimeters. So this is uh, the kind of accuracies which we get. So this data we use basically and then plot the velocity. So this is, as you can see, these are the velocity vectors at all the stations using this data over a period of like each station has a data of around three to uh, some of the stations has 20 years of data. Like what I cannot, I think has 20 lay and handle as 20 years whereas some stations have three to four years span of data so you can see all the arrows so i think the black arrows are the continuous station velocities and the red are the campaign station velocities and then you have igs stations also this is the data which we analyzed from 1995 to 2020 see if we use gamut and we have written shell scripts for automated processing we give the position in near real time also because, you know, if you do, if you give the position, uh, velocities, we give post-processing because, you know, precise orbits are available 15 days. Like for today, you want a precise orbit of the satellites. It is available online as an IGS product 15 days later. So post-processing and deriving the velocities, uh, you need to wait for 15 days. But on the fly, we have shell schemes which give the position for uh, in near real time that is with a delay of 30 minutes so we use gamut gamut is easier because you can write scripts and run and all once you understand the program so now how do we what are the applications so i'll start with says i will cover four applications one is seismic and then i will cover uh, how it is applied for landslides then remote sensing that is for water vapor and total electron content so this is the seismic research uh, so i think if anyone has any questions they can ask in between or later on i think questions, I think questions later, later on yes later on okay so this is the seismicity map seismicity map of india which we had plotted at our institute. My colleague, Dr. Parvez, has plotted it, taking all the historical data, I think, from 625 AD till date. So wherever there was focal mechanism. So this shows that we have most of the earthquakes are all plate boundary earthquakes, and we have few within the uh, plate interiors. So, and our 
I averaged basically this is our network. I instead of so many vectors, I put an average vector for each of the regions. So you can see the Indian plate motion in the international terrestrial reference frame is in the northeast direction. So you can see the velocity vectors which we got from GPS. This is the plate interiors. This is in the Himalayas. This is see northeast is a separate unit. You can't. It does not belong to rigid Indian plate nor in the Himalayan segment. This is a separate thing. I'll show you the results of. And then you have uh, Andamans, which is again separate tectonic unit. And northeast behaves completely different from the rest of the plate interior sites. And then you have Himalayas from Kashmir, Ladakh, Garhwal, Kumeon. To um, this is Nepal Himalaya. Nepal Himalaya also has a lot of publications. Then you have Bhutan, Sikkim, then uh, Arunachal Himalaya. So Arunachal Himalaya comes in the north, northeast Himalayas. Then you have a northeast tectonic unit. Then you have a plate interior. So I will show results from all these like Andamans, then the plate interiors, then northeast and Himalayas from east to west. This is a 2500 kilometer Himalayan arc. So what does this, this see? What you get is the surface deformation. So you can use the surface deformation to study both along the plate boundaries and at plate interiors, what is the kind of deformation Indian plate? What is the deformation on Indian plate? And then you use inverse models. This is where uh, my expertise is. I use inverse models to say, what is that that is uh, happening in the subsurface structure that causes the surface motion? So we go from the top to the down. So that th this we can do wherever so when you do not have any earthquakes, that becomes an interseismic uh, deformation and interseismic slip models. If you have an earthquake like in Sumatra or Burj, so then when we have the co-seismic surface motion, we can actually model the rupture of the earthquake and say this earthquake has ruptured this much. This is the length, the width, the, and this is the slip on the rupture, which caused this co-seismic displacement over the surface. So, and then we can also model the post-seismic. After the earthquake, continuously you measure for three, four years, and then we can model the post-seismic relaxation, how the whatever rupture that occurred during the earthquake is settling down and how it is this thing. And then uh, that is one part of it. And the other part of it is, since you have a motion over a period of time, you can find out the strain rates. So the strain rates with GPS gives a short term that is like if you have a 20 year data, you have a 20 year strain rate. Those are called geodetic strain rates, but it gives the current strain accumulation in that region. And then you have historical earthquakes. You take the earthquakes and calculate the street seismic strain rates. So you know since the last earthquake, what was this uh, seismic strain that stored energy since the last earthquake? And what is the geodetic strain uh, stored energy? Then you can compare and then you can say that this much strain accumulation is there, which is capable of uh, generating a magnitude earthquake, magnitude 7 or 8 earthquake in the recent future. So that is also one of the applications. So I will show all the applications, a glimpse of each and uh, every application. So before that, since we have our velocities in international reference frame, first we have to get the regional velocities. How do we get the regional velocities? Because you know, the international reference frame is a global velocity. So we have to remove the angular velocity of the Indian plate from it. Once you subtract the angular velocity of the Indian plate, then you get the motion India fixed velocities. So we use that India fixed velocities to do all the modeling. So for that, so if you see here, this is our Indian plate. All these blue vectors are our stations, Indian plate velocities. And these are the IGS stations, which are outside of the Indian plate. So we mod, we use this and then we come out, we estimate the angular velocity of Indian plate. So see this angular velocity figure, like if you can see the, this, all these things on the left hand side shows the so basically, Indian plate is rotating. So it shows where is the pole of rotation and what is the magnitude of the rotation. That is the angular velocity of Indian plate, which you have to subtract to get the regional velocity. 
if you can see there are different poles of rotation see the more data you add the more data you add the more precise is your angular velocity so we had uh, and also it depends on the reference frame so we have given two angular velocities with uh, almost two decades of data on the rigid indian plate so and we also see we got some data from isr also so we had used all the data and then we gave in itrf 08 and then again uh, in itrf 14 so see for each of the slides i have given down the um, articles from where you can get more information and even if you go to my see i only update my google scholar profile page so there you can see all the publications and you can relate the publication if you want to know the details you can go click on it and get it so once we get the angular velocity of the indian plate we plot we remove that and then plot the regional velocity see now you can see it's all moving southwest basically all the stations in himalayas you can see there is a velocity quite an amount of velocity around uh, in himalayas you get around 12 to 20 mm whereas in anani we get around 26 mm but that is a different again a, a different uh, tectonic unit so uh, so back most of your deformation is in the himalayan boundary and then in the northeast uh, indo burmese arc and then in the port blair whereas the plate interiors you do not see much deformation it is all like uh, the deformation is much lesser than error bar so once you get this india fixed velocities then we start interpreting and looking at the results region wise so first we will go and see when there is an earthquake so this is how when there is an earthquake we had an earthquake in sumatra which is one of the largest earthquake so we had measurements before and after so you can see how much andaman has moved uh, due to this earthquake so like if you see uh, kar nikobar has moved around 6 meters this vector is 6 meters then uh, the north andaman diglipur is i think around 4 meters motion southwest and the remaining are in between so if you see uh, this here we could even uh, capture the subsidence and uplift due to the rupture so at karnikobar we had a subsidence of 1 meter whereas in uh, north andaman we had an uplift of around 0.5 meters so it shows that between karnikobar and the north andaman there is a change from subsidence to uplift so we use the surface deformation you can see here when uh, zoomed figures of surface deformation at each of the stations and not only here but even the stations in, on the indian subcontinent have also uh, registered some sort of co seismic motion at iisc kodai canal you know after this earthquake they had to reset the difference frame for indian subcontinent because mm -hmm. even the igs stations have moved during the earthquake so you know your your reference itself reference frame itself has moved so actually if you go and see till to in in this this things that reference frame itrf velocities and coordinates of igs stations you can see that you have a particular position and velocity till 2005 and after that a separate one starts because it has changed so even iisc all of them have moved because it shook the whole of this region so what we do is we model what is the rupture that caused this deformation so as you can see these rectangular rectangles are the rupture planes of length the width and the slip along the rupture so we have given the best fit Uh, our observed velocities four rupture zones starting from uh, campbell bay then karnikoba then port uh, uh, blair and diglipur so you can see the modeled see one is modeled one is green and blue one is modeled one is observed so you can see how close a model velocity is to the observed velocity so this is inverse modeling so the, here we use inverse modeling to do that we have written our own code for it and it there is no software we didn't use any software for this and then uh, this is when you have an earthquake when you do not have an earthquake first we'll talk about plate interiors the rigid indian plate 
So if you plot the strain rates in the plate interiors, you can see at IAC, Kodak and all, I have plotted the strain rates, Puna, etc. So basically what it shows is that the strain is to, at the order of 10 to the power of minus 9 and it, there is no, see there are some papers which they say there is a, uh, there is a, Narmada rift has uh, segmented the rigid Indian plate, but it does not, I mean, our results does not show anything like that. So this whole thing behaves as one unit, the plate interior, and it moves with the angular velocity of Indian plate, Indian tectonic plate. And the earthquakes, then you might ask why we are having in plate interior earthquakes like Latur, Buj and all. This happens because of some local uh, deformation on the local faults etc. It has nothing to do with the Indian plate motion as such. So this is one of the results which we gave uh, using two decades, two to three decades of data for the plate interior. Then Northeast, as I have told you before also, Northeast is a separate tectonic unit because you know, all the stations in Northeast have a southward velocity of 7 mm, around 7 mm. That is quite an amount when you compare the plate interiors. And Himalayas have around uh, 16 to 19 mm. So then we plotted all the velocities of um, Assam and Shillong Plateau and we saw that most of them it moves as a one rigid block. So which I call it as SHAS block, this portion. And then when I, when I tried to find out the angular velocity of the block, then I got a clockwise rotation. And this is the angular velocity of Assam Shillong block. So this is one of the results and we also detected uh, motion along the Copley fault and see whenever there is a fault and you have measurements which give the motion of the fault on the either side of the fault, you can model it to find what is the locking depth of the fault, what is the width and what is the slip along the fault that caused this deformation on the top. So this is another very Mm, this is also again inverse modeling, but this is one of the things which we can get from the surface deformation. Then you also get like for Himalayan arc, uh, arc normal convergence, which I have given here. Himalayan models I will show later. Then Indo-Burmese arc also accommodates like our Indo-Burmese arc where we have these three stations, Lumami, Impal and Aizwal. So they show that we are accommodating around 16 millimeters of motion of the India Burma plate motion basically. So this is uh, uh, results from Northeast India. So now coming to Himalayas. This is something which is very interesting because it's an active deformation ongoing. So here we can, we start with basically Ladakh, uh, Kashmir Himalaya that is now an active thing on the west and this whole 2500 kilometer arc these eastern and western Nepal stations are not ours. These are the published velocities and we have given rupture models for the, for the published velocity. So when you start like for example we take Garhwal Himalaya. So we have this many vectors. This is India fixed motion. So we model what is the motion on the main Himalayan thrust. What is the locking depth of the main Himalayan thrust? What is the width of the main Himalayan thrust and slip in this region? So when we do this across Himalayas, we notice that, you know, it is not same. The slip on the main, main Himalayan thrust is not same from Kashmir to Arunachal. It's not uniform. It is different segments. And even the depth, the locking depth varies from around 12 to 20 across the Himalayas and the width also varies from around 70 to 110 kilometers, I guess, from the and the slip also varies from 12 to 20. So we gave all the slip models. These are all slip models along main Himalayan thrust. So for all, for Kashmir, then Garhwal, Kumeon, West Nepal, East Nepal, Sikkim and Arunachal. And in Ladakh, we gave um, uh, models for Karakuram fault. What is the slip across Karakuram fault? That is what we have given for Ladakh. So this kind of doing inverse modeling. So you can see the figure. It shows you the slip uh, across this main Himalayan thrust segments. So this is, uh, the, uh, this is again one more sort of modeling where I have told you, you have both 
this is something which recently we did sapna kati one one of my colleagues had come out with this uh, concept that we should be able to um when i do composite analysis of the geodetic and seismic strain rate so geodetic strain rates you get from gps measurements seismic strain rates you get from uh, uh, past history of earthquakes so this is the geodetic strain rates of garhwal kumbhon himalaya so what we did here was we took almost like more than 100 100 plus stations all published velocity vectors plus our velocity vectors everything we took and then we took the best which have um, uh, less than 3 mm of uh, error and then we took to calculate the principal strain rate so we got around 100 nano strain per year and then we calculated the seismic strain rates of 50 years 100 years uh, 200 years and 700 years so you can see on the right hand side we plotted both seismic and geodetic strain rate so when it comes to 700 years it kind of um, seismic and geodetic strains kind of match each other so when now that we have this so we say okay this is the released strain energy this is the stored strain energy since the last earthquake how much is released how much is stored so you can calculate the strain budget and then you can say in garhwal kumbhon himalaya we said that any time a magnitude earthquake 8 magnitude earthquake is possible and it may go up to 8.38 but the highest magnitude when depending on the see the problem with the historical earthquakes is we do not have the magnitudes or the focal mechanism solutions precisely so we assume them so once we assume then again the error comes so Uh, taking the minimum preferred magnitude minimum uh, assumptions to the highest magnitude based on the paleo seismic signatures and all so the magnitude of the possible earthquake also varies from like in garhwal commune we got magnitudes of 8 possible earthquakes from 8 to 8.38 8.4 so this is uh, uh, how we uh, do composite analysis of geodetic and seismic strain rates and the next slide is our recent work in kashmir valley we where you know we have integrated broadband seismic information and gps so we got using our broadband uh, seismic events what is the northern i mean how we de demarcate the northern edge of the what is basically the depth the locking depth of mht and what is the northern edge of mht so we had those two values which we got from our broadband seismic data and then we also um, had our velocity vectors and our slip models from which we we again got the locking depth and the, this thing and then we refined our models using the actual broadband seismic um, uh, data and then we gave the uh, integrated both these things to get the best fit model for main himalayan test so this is one of its where we integrated our results from both broadband and gps to get the best fit model so this you can see is our best fit model for kashmir himalaya and um, these vectors are basically the stations of uh, in pakistan because there was an earthquake here in 2005 so still the post seismic relaxation of the earthquake is on in this region so this is that one and then we this is one part of it other part of it we calculated geodetic strain rates for kashmir and gave this is the strain budget here compare it with seismic and say this is the strain budget and the magnitude 7.8 earthquake is possible in this region now we are refining this because you know our network is not um, that spatially distributed so now we are adding some more stations here so that we can refine this our estimate of the earthquake and also the seismic and geodetic seismic strain rates remain the same the geodetic strain rates basically so this is uh, as far as uh, seismic research and gps is concerned now coming to landslide research see we use gps and we use models so uh, this is a very this thing so this is the landslide hazard here what we did was in consult in with the uh, cbri we monitored two landslides in people koti near people koti on the highway so you can see this this is our room where you know they have put all geotechnical real time geotechnical investigations like uh, 
uh, rain gauge meter, then pore pressure meter, everything they have put. And all the data real time, it goes to this room and this room is connected to CBRI. So you get it in real time to CBRI. So they had real time landslide. So as a part of this, we did uh, basically GPS instrumentation for this. So this is our reference GPS site in uh, CBRI. And then this is the um, uh, reference site at the People Koti, which is away from the landslide. And then we had a set of stations over the landslide. This is a little bit um, uh, tricky because, you know, the problem what happened was the people, the reference site which we took also is moving as a whole, though it's not part of the landslide. So we had a problem analyzing this data. But then we finally figured it out and analyzed and we got geodetic strain. So these are the two landslide sections. So we took cross section of MN and CD from this two landslides and we used the data and got the geodetic strain rates. And then what we did was we did FEM modeling of the landslides and compared our strain rates with FEM strain rates and how the rupture progresses. So we have some few results here of FEM models so because FEM model gives overall how the landslide is moving. So this is, uh, I am only showing a one section CD and on this section. So uh, this is the displacement uh, which we got FEM and it matches with the geodetic displacement which we picked up using our GPS. And then this is the um, strain rates. We also have stress, how the stress varies and all. I think that slide is not here. And then we gave a set of conclusions, how we can use FEM models and how realistic they are for landslide uh, modeling. So then coming to the next application, GNSS remote sensing. So here basically this is a completely like I have said, you know, you have uh, the signal when it passes through satellite to the uh, receiver, uh, it passes through troposphere and ionosphere. So this is uh, one of its kind. So like I've given in a nutshell, I gave you a, a flow chart. So this is the GPS signal delay. Then you get ZTD, it's called Zenith Tropospheric Delay. So this has two components, dry delay, Zenith hydrostatic delay and wet delay, Zenith wet delay. So this dry delay we can estimate, see this is what GPS gives at every 30 second interval because you are, uh, uh, signal is, uh, you are tracking the signal every 30 seconds. So this, you get it very precisely using GPS. Then, then you can estimate zenith hydrostatic delay. There is an equation, it's a function of pressure and temperature. So you can estimate the zenith hydrostatic delay. Then you subtract Z, ZTD minus ZHD will give you the wet delay. So this wet delay is related to water vapor. I will maybe the next slide has the equation I will show you and you get a very precise water vapor. Actually abroad and all in America and all they get this in near real time 30 second and it goes as an input into the weather forecasting models. So it improves the way they forecast the rainfall and all that. Whereas uh, this is the tropospheric part of it and if you go to ionospheric part of it then you, here you can calculate the total electron content. This also again at uh, the 30 second interval. This is actually very compute intensive. And we wrote our own code for this. Ionospheric delay. How to compute ionospheric. There are some softwares available uh, for this. But then we had written our own code. And we use our own software for this. And then uh, which gives us the total electron content for the GPS signals. So basically you take the phase advances and delays and then uh, the, the file, Rhinex file of the GPS and then get the total electron content. So how do we use? So this can be used for ionospheric variability studies and as a precursor to earthquakes. Like, you know, when they had the Japanese earthquake, they could get, um, uh, the evacuation time was not there, but they could get, I think, uh, three minutes in advance that uh, such a magnitude earthquake is occurring. But then there was no time for them to do any disaster management as such. But that is when they noticed that all the stations, see, the Japan has a huge network of uh, continuous running stations of 2000 plus. 
Then they realized that when they saw the ionosphere, just before the earthquake day, there is an ionosphere disturbance prior to it. So they, uh, you know, for 10 days, if you take the data and analyze 10 days before and 10 days after the earthquake, you can see prior to earthquake, there is an ionosphere disturbances. So that those uh, can be used for precursor studies. And this water vapor basically can be used for extreme rainfall, forecasting extreme rainfall events, provided we put them in near real time into weather forecast models. So uh, this is a simple uh, equation which I am saying. This is what GPS gives, zenith tropospheric delay. Then zenith hydrostatic delay, delay is a function of pressure and height. So you calculate that, then subtract, you get zenith wet delay. And zenith wet delay is related to water vapor using this. So if you want to get water vapor, see many people think, you know, that GPS data gives water vapor. GPS data does not give water vapor. GPS data gives zenith total delay. Then you have you estimate water vapor using surface pressure and temperature. So the water vapor estimation basically depends upon how precise are your surface pressure and temperatures. So if you have a co-located co MET sensor with the GPS receiver, then uh, and that MET sensor sends you data of pressure and temperature along with your GPS data, then you have the perfect, very precise water vapor. But then if that is not the case and you are using pressure and temperature from uh, NSEP models or uh, all these models, then it depends how uh, reliable your uh, water vapor is. Some, like for higher stations, the stations that are at a height, these models don't give pressure and temperature that precisely because these are all interpolated. So then you don't get your water vapor that precise. So we had published a couple of papers on this. So this is the um, uh, water vapor column, which we got average water vapor column using 15 to 20 years of data at each station. So you can see your water vapor uh, column is high in the south, southern Indian peninsula compared to because water vapor reduces as the height increases. So whereas in the northeast, you have got the highest. Uh, actually, northeast is a very good uh, region to study water vapor. Uh, water vapor variability studies. So we had picked up Northeast also for doing water vapor variability studies. Then uh, we have uh, done a lot of work in this, but I am only showing the latest one. So we, what we did was we also took the MODIS water vapor satellite. And then we plotted like for here, if you see the MODIS water vapor for uh, Hanley site, that is, you know, Hanley is a cold desert environment. Your whole water vapor itself is so less around 2 mm. So we, we wanted to know at that height how MODIS water vapor correlates with GPS water vapor. So we get a 30 second GPS water vapor, the black one, you know, the red ones, and then the MODIS water vapor also we analyzed and then we plotted daily and monthly. So this is the comparison for uh, almost 2005 to 2012 data. So and then we used, um, that is for Hanley station. So we did that, uh, extended it to the full of India for all the stations. So your background, that color is the variation of MODIS water vapor. So you have highest in Southern Peninsula, Northeast, and then medium in this region, Western, uh, uh, and then lowest in the um, Himalayas. So this is the MODIS water vapor, the background color, and this, Columns are basically the bias between the GPS and MODIS water vapor. So you can see wherever you have uh, stations at a height, the bias is more. I think red is negative bias and uh, black column is the positive bias. So the full country we have given. And then we have also modeled this, uh, how the water vapor varies with respect to height, temperature and all that also. Then for the Hanley and Lay data, which we had, there was a cloudburst in Lay and Hanley. So we wanted to know whether our data captured the cloudburst. So if you see on the left-hand side, this is a Hanley PWB data every 30 seconds, which we estimated for a period of 2003 to 13, I think 10 years, more than 10 years. And this is the rainfall correlation, which we got from the TRMM rainfall data. From the that is available online and we show so it's kind of you know there is a kind of the trend matches 
then we plotted here the water vapor so if you see this our uh, gps 2010 and 2006 they really uh, showed the peak water vapor during the cloud burst whereas modis didn't pick that up so uh, this is the end these uh, bars are the rainfall during that time so this is 2006 uh, cloud burst this is 2000 uh, i think 2010 cloud burst is the green one so for those months january to december we plotted and we could see so it can pick up that so we can use it actually they do use it abroad and all in a near real time so it can be used for uh, extreme uh, uh, events like rainfall etc so this is uh, one of the models which we gave for indian subcontinent uh, how it varies with the height because we had quite an amount of data so we gave we gave equations and particular equations and we have also given how the seasonal variability uh, when in the second order order polynomial how it varies with temperature so this is uh, one of the results which we have like that we have given quite an amount of models where you can give zdd and get directly pwb without having to do that uh, pressure and temperature it gives approximately good values which can be used so even that model we gave for indian subcontinent now coming to ionosphere studies this we started i think 4 5 5 6 years back and we have made good progress so here also you can see the your background is the iri tech that is available uh, indian regional uh, uh, iri iri tech values that are available online from satellites and the their model and then we calculated at each station our tech value and then again here we plotted the bias how much is the bias between the tech value that we we got from gps data and the model tech value so you again this red and black is plus or minus so this is your geographic and this is your geomagnetic latitude so basically in indian sub many everywhere globally you have the maximum ionosphere between 15 to 20, 15 degrees of um, geomagnetic latitude like you can see this is demarcates very clearly so this is where you have the highest and then later on it decreases so it starts and since we are near equator close to equator we can really study at low latitude uh, uh, the variability of our ionosphere this is very important see if our indian subcontinent is not where it is then ionosphere studies does not make that much impact but since it is very close to equator it gives the ionospheric variability studies have a huge range of applications so on the left hand side uh, on the right hand side if you see so we plotted both for gps tech and uh, iri tech for a particular station over a period of i think 2002 to 2020 and then we also plotted the uh, solar uh, all the indices of solar radiation so sunspot solar flux uh, etc and then we had uh, seen how it varies so it really captures very well the solar variability index uh, indices our uh, tech value which we get from gps captures it really well and whereas you know that iri tech which is currently people use which, which we get from models is actually not that precise especially when you are um, during the peak solar activity period see this data basically covers solar cycle 23 and 24 so it starts from uh, peak of solar cycle 23 and then it subsidizes then ascending phase of 24 peak of 24 and then subsidizes it has really captured it well so we can use this uh, tech values basically to study solar storms like we have done this i think for lay and hanley they have a um, observatory in uh, hanley iia has and i think iit roorkee also has so they get this they pick up those observatories they pick up the solar storms and all that so one of them approached us so we thought we will analyze our data and see whether we could pick the disturbance during that period you can see both the stations lay and hanley stations that period they picked up that disturbance very well and then we calculated using this uh, values we calculated what is the rate of tech index 
compared to white day to storm day and then we plotted it so it shows that our data captured it very well so you know this would help in uh, applying our uh, atmosphere using gps tech atmosphere variability studies for real time uh, real time situations like storms but you can really even this solar storms also it starts see like the actual day was on the 8th so you can see that it is going to start from 6th itself it goes five days before and five days after same earthquake precursor studies also they do that so this is one of the other applications in the geoscience research yeah that completes my talk so this basically gives the way i can be contacted and i only update i am not on any research gate or they now there are too many things to be on so i just simply update my google scholar profile that's it so anything is that is the only updated profile of my as far as my research is concerned thank you i'll stop sharing shall i stop sharing yes 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 ma'am yes thank you thank you so thank much madam so for such a wonderful and educative lecture we hope all our participants are highly benefited from your lecture uh, before moving ahead i would like to announce that we will take three queries from the attendees i request the participants with a query to kindly raise their hands and accordingly we may ask them to unmute themselves to clear their query from the speaker also the participants may please send the rest of their unattended questions to the email id of the convener of this workshop who will send the questions to the concerned speaker and then will send the response to your respective email ids thank you now may i request uh, honorable session chairperson professor zair kail sir to say a few words on this talk over to mm -hmm. professor kail sir i have no words professor zair thank you i think hey, you have you have from the from the scratch you have taken us to the atmosphere uh, atmosphere so every aspect of you know from right from definition of different arrays and then you have taken to all sort of uh, measurements and interpretation right from you know not only uh, geodetic strain and seismic strain but also on the landslide application and the remote sensing application the vapor and what not it was very informative thank you so much uh, you really enlightened us with a very brilliant lecture and we all are benefited with your such a informative uh, lecture ma'am i have a small query that is uh, uh, you told that the vector the velocity vector for the interplate zone is different from the interplate himalayan zone and it is much different in the northeast india zone yes i fully agree with you and uh, because northeast india we have got not only the you know collision but also subduction and the transform fault the strike fault and the plate motion is right that uh, motion of the uh, plate there now my query is in the western part in the bhuj area western india where we also have a transform fault chamon fault there is a transform fault and uh, very interestingly that the chamon fault is a uh, is left lateral and then the part the indian you know arabian plate uh, which is in you know, right lateral movement which is moving to the north and the pakistan in the along chamon fault it is uh, left lateral so there is a very complicated situation so what i want to say that uh, like that of northeast india where you have transform fault uh, mechanism and you are saying that there is a uh, there is a uh, you know velocity vector is different whether you observe velocity different velocity vector uh, vector in the western part of the extreme western part of the indian plate that is my query and the second query is now how uh, you have talked about the subsidence and uh, upliftment of the you know uh, coastal deformation particularly in andaman island after this mega earthquake uh, compared to the you know horizontal displacement how now the vertical displacement 
the precision is how much, what is the range. So these are the two queries if you can please educate me. Thank you so much. Yeah. See, uh, when we did our measurements, see, we ran a separate campaign for Northeast. So we had huge amounts of data. And the measurements, the vector showed that it behaves as a different tectonic unit. It's not part of a rigid Indian plate. Whereas in the Burj, the, all the stations which the data, most of the data of the Burj stations was given by ISR, Pallabi and uh, Sumer and all of them. So all the da data I had basically does not show the vectors are same as rigid Indian plate vectors. It does not show that uh, Gujarat is behaving like a different tectonic unit. At least when I published that time, it did not show. But maybe if you have more data and we analyze, I don't rule out. See, anything right. is possible. But the okay. data which I had, when there was a limitation on the Gujarat side. So then we can say maybe Gujarat also behaves like a different tectonic unit. That we'll have to see. That I think Sumer can throw light on that because they have... I went to ISR, they have real-time network of 40 plus stations. Yes, yes. They, ha they are having so much of valuable data and they might have published also because I, nowadays, you know, I don't get time, I don't follow. So they might have also, so maybe Sumer can throw light on that. Then coming to the height aspect of it, see, the errors are up to maximum... Um, uh, 10 millimeters. So if you have a signal of more than 10 millimeters in the height component, like when you have an earthquake, see like the subsidence was 1.1 meter, whereas you know our yes. error bars are between 10 to 20 millimeters. So yes. then we have a clear cut signal. But if you have to uh, do study that heights, you know, the leveling and all that, then GPS would be hard because you know, then your signal and the error bar a kind of trade-off between the both. Right. Whereas yeah. if you have an earthquake, it's a clear cut because your motion is in meters and your error bars are in millimeters. So that is how uh, it comes. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you for clarification. Over to Anchor, please. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I would like to request Honorable Director of Institute of Seismological Research, Gujarat, Dr. Sumir Sopra, sir, to say a few words on this talk. Over to Dr. Sopra, sir. Thank you, madam, for a very wonderful lecture. Actually, it's uh, benefited us a lot, particularly me. Actually, you started beautifully with the uh, fundamentals of the GPS, and then you uh, took us to all the spectrum of study, different studies which GPS uh, can perform. So I think it will be beneficial for the student, particularly students, and for us also to know some fundamentals of uh, GPS because we go through a lot of papers and uh, these days I think uh, this integrated research is uh, is uh, taking a shape and so we should know the some fundamentals of GPS, some geophysics, geology, climate also. A lot of things are going on. So it uh, it's a really a very wonderful lecture. And regarding Madam Bhuj, we have done a lot of study and we have published a lot of papers and we have done a lot of work on GPS also. I don't think it is uh, behaving like a micro plate. It, the, the, it is moving in the same direction with the same speed, uh, just like an Indian plate. So we have uh, more than I think 15, 16 years of data, and we are not getting any you, you can say any result on anything that shows it is behaving like a different, like a micro plate. Because earlier, after Bhuj earthquake, many researchers from US, yes. uh, particularly Seth Stein, he has an uh, idea of having that uh, it is behaving like a micro plate moving differently. Yes. But we are not finding any uh, thing which supports that theory. And uh, regarding, madam, just I need one uh, your comment on because a lot of studies these days a lot of effort has been made uh, to uh, to carry out the INSAR type of studies, INSAR studies. So, what is the whether which one is better and which has advantage or GPS or this? Because in INSAR we can cover a lot of area in very shortest uh, uh, the possible time. And in GPS, a lot of logistic issues are also there. So according to your and your uh, experience, which one is better and whether we should uh, continue with the, our GPS studies alongside the uh, INSAR studies or we, we can uh, move towards INSAR slowly. So just I want your opinion on this. See, this is one area, you know, which I was very keen to work for past almost like 15 years, but then I never got time. 
So I tried to give to some students, but it didn't work out. See, it is a very, no one has done in the country. And it's a very, very good research area. And for Gujarat, with the kind of data you have, see, INSAR gives you the displacement, surface displacement as a, like, full area. So, you know, you have at least uh, two to three GPS stations. Then you can tie up your GPS displacement with the what you got from INSAR. Then you can get the same kind of uh, integration between GPS and INSAR. Then you can correct if there is some uh, correction that has to be made in the INSAR displacements. Then you would get very, you know, kind of a count displacement contour covering the whole of the region, which is never possible using GPS. So it's a very nice area, GPS inter INSAR integration to do. Then you can do displacement maps for the country, for, for, when you can start with Gujarat, so you get a displacement map of Gujarat because INSAR gives you the overall full at each and every point. It is because it is a satellite, it covers it uniformly. So once you have your GPS, at least at 10 stations in that you have, then you can, uh, you know, integrate both of them together and come out with a very precise displacement. Then, you know, you can come out with strain map and stress map. So it is something which is very no one has done and you know and it is something which i wanted to do for long but that is an area which you i think isr should definitely do it Actually, madam, uh, uh, dr rakesh dumka has started uh, working in this field so he has uh, generated some maps from the you can say uh, this katrol hill region so according to according to that research, the eastern part of the Katrol Hill uh, fault is more active than the western part. That's so he has, he has just started this work and I think in a couple of years he may cover the entire Gujarat region. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's little when it's the beginning, somewhere we have to make it. Actually, we should be able to cover the entire India, you know. Uh, yeah. I, read, I recently uh, reviewed a paper, I think, from IIT or somewhere on the finite element model, stress strain model for the full Indian subcontinent. That was really good. So if you, you know, that can be become a base and we do INSAR stress strain model using INSAR GPS integration, then we can see how it, uh, because, you know, stress strain maps are very important for any country, you know, because that give a glimpse of the actual deformation. And in inside maps, you can keep updating as and when you get the new one. Thank you, madam. Over to the speaker. Thank you so much, sir and madam. Uh, now we have a query from one of our audience. Um, so I would like to request Dr. Rakesh K. Dumka to kindly unmute yourself and ask your query. Hello, Dr. Rakesh K. Dumka. Unmute yourself and ask your question. I think he's not able to unmute. Any issues there? Maybe there is an issue with his internet connectivity. Uh, so as we have limited time uh, in our schedule, so I would like to request all the attendees who have their queries to kindly email it to us and we will forward it to our consent speaker and send her send reply replies to your respective email IDs. So the now I would like to request are not able to unmute. I think the control is with the main person, so they're not able to unmute. Uh, she turns on for busy or he says he's having some question. Please. Okay, okay. Sorry, sir. Mr. Citronson, please go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, uh, Please say loudly. Please say loudly. Now it is audible. Your voice is not clear. This. Yeah, uh, madam, actually, I have been handed uh, down some courses here. Uh, my background is technology. 
So as the crustal deformation, uh, the velocity is very low, almost the millimeter to centimeter. So in your study, like GPS, we need some very precise measurement so that we can go as a crustal deformation velocity precisely. So how the accuracy has been achieved in your study? And there are various factors uh, that like atmospheric conditions at the time, including the, with, uh, the measurement. So how uh, the atmospheric condition in real time, how it has been corrected or accounted? Actually, you know, I, I think uh, I couldn't understand that because maybe the voice also. See, what I understood was what are the uh, accuracy. See, for deformation you get up to. See, we do not take anything which has an error bar of three above three millimeters. Even for strain analysis for anything, all the velocity should be below the three millimeter error bar. That is uh, one thing. See, the more amount of data you have, more duration that your errors go down. Because it is all statistical, na? so the errors go down. As far as velocities are concerned, when it comes to water vapor and tech also, that is a different kind because there it is not. See, there the external factors come. Like for water vapor, it also depends on how precise are your pressure and temperature. See, if you have a co-located met sensors, then you are sorted out. Otherwise, again, there, other than the error in the ZTD, you again accumulate errors from t pressure, temperatures, which you get from satellites, which you interpolate. And uh, when it comes to total electron content, that, that also again depends on the data we have. So, it's kind of a trade-off because when you, whenever there are models involved in solving equations, you always have some kind of accumulated errors, you know, so that that is there, but that is why we should be very careful that your signal should be much uh, bigger than the error. Okay. So that is what should be your uh, thing. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Dr. Akes, if you can out, uh, unmute yourself. Dr. Akes. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello, Rakesh. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you, ma'am, for giving a uh, very nice and informative talk to us, actually. So I I, I, I am uh, thankful to Sumer Chopra, sir. So he just, uh, before starting your uh, lecture, he uh, told me that you just attend that lecture, actually. So I am uh, grateful to our directors and also. So ma'am, uh, my question is related to the comparison of geodetic strain and this uh, seismic strain as you talk about the like uh, uh, we can calculate the strain uh, like we can say uh, strain deficit based on that actually how much uh, strain remains in the area so uh, like uh, as we have to take the seismic uh, like uh, for calculation of the seismic strain we have to take the earthquake data so what would be the like threshold limit of the earthquake data like uh, in our i am uh, i can give the example from kas region here we are getting like uh, very small uh, earthquakes also like because of the our network actually uh, close network so uh, like uh, even uh, one magnitude one or magnitude earthquakes or uh, even sometime uh, less than that we are uh, getting so what would be the like uh, threshold limit for that uh, to uh, like uh, take the that earthquake data to calculate the seismic strain See, actually, you know, in the in the Gujarat Buj region, it's very complicated. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, Rajiv Yadav from uh, Sapna and Rajiv from uh, I think Rajiv is from NGRA. Sapna is working some. They yeah. both together they came out for the Kutch region seismic and geodetic strain. Yeah. So based on uh, Vinit's publication, they took the geodetic strain. I was also part of that uh, um, publication. Right. I I don't remember uh, what magnitudes. If Sapna is there, she can elaborate. I think she should be there uh, participating. But I can't remember because that's their paper. So what is the magnitude threshold? I do not remember. But yeah. it is very complicated. There we did a gridded thing and compared the. It's not like a straightforward uh, grids we did, and then compared the geodetic strain of each grid with seismic strain. I think that is published recently. Okay. But I don't know the magnitude, uh, what was the threshold they took. That time. Because, you know, would you have continuously events, huh? Yeah. 
Mm, it's a very active region. If Sapna yeah. is there, maybe online she can say. I don't know whether she's there. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now, may I request Mr. Prasujya Borthaku, Junior Research Fellow of Geoscience and Technology Division CSRNIS, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Over to Mr. Prasujya. Thank you, Mr. Navajuti. Namaskar and good afternoon to all. As today's event has come to an end, it is my immense pleasure to convey heartfelt thanks to each and everyone on behalf of the entire CSR NIST family and the organizing members of IBWGST 2022. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sri Devi Jade Ma'am for accepting our invitation and delivering such an educative talk. Thank you so much, Ma'am, for such a wonderful and edifying lecture. It was a great pleasure to have you as a keynote speaker for this international workshop. Our deep sense of gratitude goes to our honorable director, sir, Dr. Z. Narahari Sastraji, for his tremendous support and guidance in each and every step of the workshop. Our heartfelt appreciation to the international advisor, Professor Andrew J. Michael, USGS, Professor Dapeng Zhao from Tohoku University, Japan, and Sessions Chairperson, Professor J. R. Kyle, former Deputy Director General, ZSI, Government of India, for their thoughtful insight for these live sessions. I'd also like to thank the special guest of today's session, Dr. Sumit Chopra, Director, ISR, for his kind presence despite of his busy schedule. I further take this opportunity to express our profound gratitude to the session's co chairperson, Dr. Uvivit Suryanto from UZM Indonesia, and Dr. Devojit Hazarika from Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology for providing needful guidance. I'd also like to thank Dr. Santana Borova, sir, the convener of IBWGST 2022 for his devotion towards this international workshop. A special thanks goes to the members of the technical and organizing committee of, for their months of hard work and dedication. Last but not the least, I express my deep sense of appreciation to all the attendees for their active participation in today's event. We, the IBWGST team, wish for your continued support throughout this event, and we look forward to see you all sharply at 10 a.m. tomorrow, Indian Standard Time. Our keynote speaker for tomorrow's session is Dr. Justin Rubinstein, a research geophysicist from United States Geological Survey. I repeat, we look forward to see you all in the tomorrow's session at 10 a.m. India Standard Time. Our keynote speaker for tomorrow's session is Dr. Justin Rubinstein, research geophysicist from United States Geological Survey. On this note, we're signing off from today's event. Namaskar, Dhainabad. Thank you. Thank you. Madam, thank you. Sir, thank you. Sir, thank you. Thank you, madam. Sir. Thank you.